the journey of life, a road ingrained with the footprints, hoof marks and flipper stains of every living creature on the planet. But how different are the journeys of mice and men, of wasp and crab? Once we're born, the race is on to find a mate and earn ourselves a little genetic immortality before it's all over. Each and every species on our planet has evolved a different way of travelling life's road. But the goal's always the same. And it all ends in death. We're all going to die! What I mean is, we're all going to die. That's one of the few certainties in life. Without fail, undeniably, categorically, one day it'll all come to an end. So why are we afraid of dying? It's not really something to get all hot and bothered about, more something to get cold and stiff about. In fact, it's so predictable that it's not even remotely scary. There is absolutely nothing frightening about death at all. Death is always with us. Most of us like to pretend he's not there, but people die, animals die, cabbages die. That's life. So enjoy yourself. You may just be over your shoulder, but relax, it's the same for every living thing on our planet. We're all in it together. So sit back, enjoy the view. There are certain things we can do to cheat death, at least for a while anyway. Although death's inevitable, Janet and John know that keeping fit and eating well will give them the best chance of a long life. But death is a patient soul. In waiting games, the immortals always win. In the War of the Wild, the most common way for an animal to cheat death is to avoid becoming something else's lunch. One of the best ways of doing this is by camouflage. Animals have taught us the art of camouflage. Don't get seen and you won't get eaten. We haven't quite mastered this art. Hiding may seem like the coward's option, but it's one of the most successful strategies. Many animals have become masters of disguise. Insects are generally the best at pretending to be something else. More often than not, they choose to look like plants. This is a surefire way of avoiding being eaten. No self-respecting carnivore would ever dream of eating salad. But they don't always get it right. This insect has disguised himself as an insect, not quite grasping the concept. When you scan the menu in your favourite restaurant, the dish called bird dropping is seldom a popular choice, which is lucky for this caterpillar of the swallowtail butterfly. The less appetising you make yourself look, the less likely you are to be eaten. This white fluff looks fairly unappetising, but it's actually made up of tiny white flatted bugs. Their feathery coating makes them look like tiny flowers. In a big clump, they look like a flowering plant. It's only on closer inspection that we can see their eyes. They don't die and get eaten, but they often end up in flower arrangements. But it's not just insects that have perfected this art. This young batfish spends its time in the shallows of the mangrove forests in coastal Africa. It drifts with the debris undetected, disguised as a dead mangrove leaf. A young triple-tailed fish also uses the same plan. By swimming on its side, it perfects the deception and it's also able to keep a lookout above and below at the same time. Birds too have gone down the road of deception. This tawny frogmouth looks exactly like the broken end of a dead branch. 
In fact, it was filmed completely by accident. We sent the camera crew out to make a film about dead branches, and they came back with this. Camouflage works best if you stay close to home and blend in. But death keeps the odds in his favour by unfairly changing the scenery. As the seasons change, so must the camouflage. The rock ptarmigan lives in northern climes, where half the year the ground is covered by snow. So in winter, it sheds its feathers and changes colour from brown to white. But the predators have caught on to this plan too. It's very difficult to spot the ptarmigan against the snow, but the arctic fox has a keen eye and nose. So only when the ptarmigan move do they give themselves away. Arctic hares also change their coats in winter, but unless they change their attire every day, they'll be out of step with the latest spring fashions. They'll stand out a mile, and this is bad news. With a white coat, it's fairly suicidal to make a run over dark ground. Death could come on swift wings for the badly dressed hare. Death misses his chance this time. But the master of the quick change is undoubtedly the squid. Squid and octopus can change colour instantly. They can do this because they have special cells in their skin called chromatophores. The chromatophores work by allowing different colour layers within the skin to be seen. This squid is snuggling down into a lovely gravelly duvet until only its eyes are showing. He gets a double benefit from camouflage. He avoids death and his predators, and he also hides from his prey. Of course, there are other methods of avoiding death. It's not all about hide and seek. Some good old fashioned armor usually does the job. This is a pangolin, one of the weirdest looking creatures on the African plains. But looking this absurd has its advantages when it comes to cheating death. These young hyenas like the idea of pangolin pie, but the horny crust is impossible to penetrate. All the pangolin has to do is curl up in a ball and wait. The razor-sharp scales can contract to crush a soft paw or a nose. These young hyenas are unsure what to make of the pangolin. All they want to do is eat it, but they're unlikely ever to succeed. Eventually, the hyenas give up and the pangolin moves off. His audience of confused hyenas look on. The crab goes one better than the pangolin. It has armour and also some formidable weapons. Vervet monkeys are partial to crab. This monkey's no fool. He knows the big crab may nip, so it's spared. But the monkey still gets his meal. He simply eats the kids. The sun is out, the sky is blue, and death is always closer than you think. <laughs> but remember, death will always try to ruin your day if he possibly can. We all come close to death on a daily basis.
but it doesn't always go his way. There are many close shades and lucky escapes. Cheetahs are the sleek killing machines of the plains. They're the fastest cats in the world and they need to be. With muscular hindquarters, long legs and a tail for stability, cheetahs are built for running. It's lunchtime and as usual, it's Thompson's Gazelle on the menu. The cheetah can reach speeds of up to 100 kilometers per hour, but it can only maintain this for a short period of time, and usually if it's running in a straight line. The gazelle can't run as fast, but it's great at dodging and weaving. It's a pretty evenly matched contest. Cheetahs may be the fastest land animals on Earth, they can still have difficulty catching their food. This time, both Death and the Cheetah have been cheated. Cheetahs may be born to hunt, but they need to practice too. Once a cheetah catches up with the gazelle, it extends a paw to trip it, causing it to tumble. Good training by mum, but the real thing can be much more dangerous. This Grant's gazelle is not about to become a cheetah's lunch. One of these horns in the cheetah's side could be fatal, and both the cheetah and the gazelle have had lucky escapes. Since the invention of the movies, Hollywood has used the drama of the cliffhanger to keep us glued to the screen. But close shaves like this are nothing compared to the dramas of the wild. Beast are not exactly the most intelligent animals on the African grasslands. However, they must be doing something right as there are literally millions of them living there. Every year, when the Serengeti's rainy season ends, the wildebeest begin their annual migration. They travel more than two and a half thousand kilometers in search of food and water. Are we nearly there yet, Mum? These long treks are thirsty work. And at the end of the day, large herds of wildebeest congregate at water holes to drink and be eaten by crocodiles. The wildebeest are either so stupid or so thirsty that they're oblivious to the danger. By doing a very convincing impression of a dead tree, the crocs can get really close before they're spotted. Their faces are designed so that only their eyes and the tips of their nostrils are visible. the crocs don't get it all their own way. They'll be back, and like Death himself, they've learnt the art of being patient. Death is always waiting, and he keeps himself busy with odd jobs. There's always plenty of grass to kill, and sooner or later he knows he'll get a new customer. But even Death doesn't know who's next. Life's a lottery and there's no way of calculating the odds. Sometimes the outcome isn't as predictable as we might first think. This wolf has come across a brown hare in the meadow. 
This should generally be a foregone conclusion, as hair is often on the menu for wolves. However, this hair has really confused the wolf. In some predators, the instinct to chase and kill is only triggered when the prey starts to run away. The wolf can't understand why this hare isn't running. This is a very unusual situation. The hare has stood his ground, and he and the wolf have come to a standoff. Neither animal knows what to do next. The hare puts up a brave battle, but eventually fear gets the better of him, and he makes a run for it. Animals that escape from the jaws of death are heroes, and we all cheer on the underdog. Or in this case, the underhog. A lion versus a baby warthog? An unfair contest in anyone's book. But the warthog isn't prepared to be eaten just yet. Unbelievably, this plucky little boar takes on the king of beasts. He puts up a brave fight, and although he appears to be a bit shaken and possibly injured, he cheats death, at least for now. For all animals, killing and eating is an instinct. But show a tiger a menu and he wouldn't know what to do. It all has to fit in with a pattern. If it doesn't, then confusion reigns. This hibernating mouse has unwittingly been disturbed by a wolf. It wouldn't normally be running across the snow in broad daylight, and its appearance has surprised this wolf. The mouse is lucky. The wolf isn't seriously trying to eat it. It's in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the wolf's confused. It treats the mouse more like a toy than a meal. There's no party for the mouse, but under normal circumstances it would be dead by now. Eventually the mouse makes his escape, and the wolf is left as confused as ever. A lucky break for the mouse, but the wolf wants his toy back. As a general rule, death is the winner. And if you're dumb enough to wrestle a lion, you should expect the worst. When we die, he celebrates. If we kick the bucket, pop our clogs, croak it or pass on, death calls for champagne. There's a thousand and one ways to die, but dying after sex seems like the cruelest. For us, the idea of dying after sex is a tragedy. But imagine dying after your first time. Disaster. Salmon that don't end up in tins on the supermarket shelf return to spawn in the rivers where they were born. They often make journeys of many hundreds of kilometers to do this. Their journey can take them several days. After struggling upstream, they're exhausted before they arrive. In fact, they're already dying. Sockeye salmon turn from a silvery blue color to bright red and the males develop large hooked jaws. They'll need these to defend their territory. The female digs a nest hole and the male guards it. The best sites are fiercely contested and fighting with jealous fish will take up most of the male's remaining energy. Finally, the eggs are abandoned in the nest site. The adults gone, the eggs are left to mature and the tiny hatchlings will have to fend for themselves. The effort of spawning has taken away any last remaining energy that the salmon had. Their job done, they simply fade away 
their genes living on in the next generation. In the depths of the ocean, the female octopus makes a similar sacrifice. After mating, she finds a suitable den to lay her eggs. She produces thousands of eggs and fixes them to her den roof. Siphoning water over them keeps them clean and aerated. Tending her eggs with her tentacles, she guards them 24 hours a day. During her vigil, she's got no time to eat, and by the time her babies hatch, she'll have run out of energy and will die within hours of their birth. The tiny octopus hatchlings are then left to fend for themselves. Just imagine having death creeping up whenever you're, well, you know. But humans have sex for fun as well as for making babies, something death has overlooked. So relax, it's official. Humans don't die after sex. Adult turtles are also unlikely to die after sex, but they do get turned into soup and harassed by sharks, even the pregnant ones. No wonder they're exhausted when they finally make it up the beach. But their kids don't have it so easy. Death likes them young and tender. After incubating in the warm sand, the hatchlings all surface at the same time. Instinctively, the baby turtles head for the open ocean, some with more ease than others. Turtles produce lots of babies in order to increase the chances that some of them will make it to adulthood. Young animals are particularly vulnerable to death. Most of these turtles will die in the first few weeks, days, or even hours of their lives. Death picks on the vulnerable. And the oceans are full of danger. This young albatross hasn't learned to fly, an easy target for the tiger shark. The albatross may be an easy target, but they're not always an easy meal. Unaware of the shark's deadly reputation, the plucky young albatross fights back, a strategy that sometimes works. A very good time to learn to fly, this young bird just makes it to adulthood. So if you're an albatross, or even a humble pigeon, don't trust death. You may have survived sex and birth, but death has some specialities up his sleeve. Ways of dying that you haven't even dreamt of. This mist is carbon dioxide produced by a nearby volcano. Visible during the cold dawn, it becomes invisible in the heat of the day. Attracted by the carcass in the hollow, the palm nut vulture is expecting an easy meal. The carbon dioxide from the volcano has entered the bloodstream of the vulture and is slowly poisoning it. Not long after it lands in the hollow, it's having difficulty breathing. It gasps for oxygen. The deadly gas continues to seep from the volcano. By morning, death has claimed his next victim. Some animals drink themselves to death. The Australian outback is home to thousands of kangaroos. They've roamed this deserted area for millions of years. It's now also home to thousands of cows, kept on huge ranches fenced in by farmers. 
The problem for the kangaroos is that the ranches have been built over some of their traditional watering holes. If they want to drink, they have to cross the fence line. Water is vital in this dry land, and the kangaroos come to drink almost every day. While many of them negotiate the fences successfully, inevitably, there are casualties. Whenever the worlds of animals and man overlap, death is often the winner, and man his unwitting accomplice. This grey whale has drowned caught up in a fishing net. It's sad when animals are the accidental victims of human activity. Death winds and the gulls clear up. By far the biggest challenge that death has come up with is the weather. Changing seasons mean that animals have to survive through extremes of temperature, rainfall and wind. Out on the African plains, the weather can be cruel. For the old, sick or weak animals, it's the end of the line. When the rain fails, often death succeeds. Rivers can shrink and even dry up completely. But if you're mean and ugly and weigh two tons, no one argues about who gets the pool. These hippos have found the only remains of a river for miles. Hippos need to stay in water to protect their hairless skin from the strong African sun. They normally live in herds spaced out in large pools, but when the rivers start shrinking, the hippos are forced to get too close for comfort. But it's going to get much worse. Imagine having to share your pool with 10,000 catfish. Now, I know people who would pay good money for a face pack like this, but for the hippos, it's hell. Then even more of the water dries up, the catfish start turning into baked fish, and the hippos just cling to life. Eventually, the mud bath turns into a mud oven and death has won again. But as always with Africa, it's feast or famine, drought or flood. The rivers will fill once more and flow to the sea. When strong winds whip the seas into a violent frenzy, the animals living beneath really are in deep water. These swimming crabs usually live out at sea. A storm has washed them in. They're so perfectly adapted for swimming that their legs are useless on land. Washed up on the shore, this large shoal will be unable to return to the sea. Lying on the beach, they can't survive in the heat. They'll die here, in the sun. But it's not all bad news. Where one animal loses, another gains. This monitor lizard has smelled the tantalising aroma of dying crabs. Not difficult, really. He's now enjoying a gourmet day out at the beach. No ice creams for him. Animals eating animals is expected, but death is a master of the unexpected. The Venus flytrap works by trapping unsuspecting insects and then digesting them with plant juices. Or at least, that's the plan. These plants can live in areas with poor soil, since they get their nutrients from animals. It may take a long time, but when it does eventually catch a fly, there really is no escape. A slow and embarrassing death for the fly.
killing isn't just about eating, and death has given the animals lots of reasons to kill one another. Fortunately, as humans, we very rarely have fatal conflicts over mates. This red deer stag is defending his right to mate, and he's prepared to fight to the death for it. He uses his large antlers to fight off rival males during the rutting season. Females stay in herds, and they'll mate with the strongest male. If he wants to leave many copies of his genes, he'll have to fight for it. The antlers can inflict fatal wounds, and these are intense battles. By the time the rutting season ends, many of the older males will have exhausted themselves fighting and mating. They often don't survive the following winter. Think tortoise, think deadly fighting machine. No. But male tortoises regularly fight for the right to breed. When a tortoise lands on its back, the race is on to right itself before the sun becomes baking hot. The victor in these contests stands by laughing as his victim slowly bakes to death. Hmm, sun-dried tortoise could catch on. Male lions live in bachelor groups until they're strong enough to take over a pride. The group will oust the old males and take control. When this happens, the first thing they want to do is mate with the females, producing cubs containing their own genes. Females won't breed while they're still suckling young cubs, and so the new male lions will kill the existing cubs to bring the females back into season. Cruel and wasteful may be, but the males can't waste time looking after a pride of another male's offspring. Death precedes new life. The new cubs will be looked after by newer, stronger males. The death of their brothers and sisters has given them the best possible chance of survival. We've all heard the expression, survival of the fittest, and death really puts this to the test with disease. We treat disease, and in the Western world, a high percentage of us survive serious illness every day, but not so in the animal kingdom. Jackals scavenge for food across the grasslands of Africa. Social animals, they have close contact with other members of their pack. When life is good, they spend time playing, reinforcing the bonds within their family unit. But diseases are common on the plains, particularly rabies. Unwittingly, the jackals will pass the rabies from one to another. In this way, when one member of a family gets the disease, it's likely the whole pack will die. When animals die, death isn't the only victor. The scavenger will always profit from death. Every corpse is essentially a gold mine. For vultures and undertakers alike. Vultures are the true undertakers of the plains. Without them, the Serengeti would be covered in half-eaten corpses. Not a pretty sight. They collect in large groups, waiting for the bigger predators to finish their meal. Jackals, hyenas and vultures all thrive on death. And corpses are such sought-after commodities that invariably squabbles break out. 
vultures are beautifully designed for stripping a carcass. They've got bald heads which they can stick deep inside the corpse without getting unsightly blood on their feathers. They also have very sharp pointed beaks which means that no bone is left unpicked. North America, wolves are the top predators. They're pack animals and they work as a coordinated team when hunting. This is especially important during the winter when food can be hard to come by. When the wolves do make a kill, it must be shared out among the pack and there are a lot of hungry mouths to feed. Ravens are members of the crow family. They're very intelligent birds and they've earned themselves reputations for being mischievous. Their striking black colour and curious ways have meant that through history they've become associated with darkness and sometimes death itself. Legend has it that a raven's favourite food is the body of a dead man. Ravens are frequently found near a wolf kill. Naturally, the wolves aren't that keen on sharing their hard work, so they try to defend the carcass even after they're too full to eat any more. But the clever ravens will be back. probably among the world's most hated sites. Yet they're essential. Along with bacteria, they decompose the very last remains of a body. Which is just as well, as otherwise the surface of our planet would be covered in corpses. Although we certainly don't like to think of maggots eating our bodies, they do. So deal with it, or get cremated. And we can gain some satisfaction knowing that maggots are invariably eaten by something else too. In this case, it's the lucky toad that gets the tasty maggot snack. However, one of the startling ways that we differ from animals is in how we deal with death. Most creatures don't recognise death in the sad way that humans do, which is probably just as well, or scenes like this would be commonplace. This lion is part of a scientific study, and she has a very sick cub. She tries to help it and carries it around, hoping to revive it. She's obviously very worried about the cub, but doesn't know what to do about it. It's clear that she recognises that something is very wrong. Her natural instincts are telling her not to abandon her cub. But this cub will die. It's very sick and stands no chance out here on the plains. Eventually, the mother lion leaves her cub. She's got no choice. Hidden among the rocks and grass, she has three more cubs who need her to look after them. If any of her offspring are to stand a chance to make it to adulthood, she can't spend her time mourning her dead cub. The laws of nature dictate that survival of the fittest means just that. These other cubs could very well grow up to be the fittest of them all. As always, death and life go hand in hand. In the Arctic, polar bears spend the long winter hidden beneath the snow, and mother will give birth to cubs in her den. In springtime, the cubs get their first chance to stretch their legs and play in the soft snow. But the Arctic is a harsh environment. Animals need to be in full health to survive here, and many don't. Polar bears usually have two cubs at once after a four-month pregnancy. The more time and care invested in a child, the harder it is to accept its death. The 
the cubs would normally stay with their mother for up to two and a half years, learning all the tricks needed to survive. This mother will now put all her energy into her one remaining cub. Elephants are among the very few animal species which are known to actually mourn the death of a family member. Elephants live in close family groups. If a member of the family is sick, they'll all take turns at trying to save it. The baby represents a large investment for the herd, and so all the other elephants will try for hours to make it get up and walk. Months and even years after an elephant has died, the other family members will return to the site of death and appear to mourn. A stillness descends over the group, and they linger at the sight of the bones, sniffing them, picking them up and touching them. They don't do this with the bones of any other species, only elephant bones. The elephants unquestionably recognise that this is one of their species. Long-lived, it may actually be true to say, an elephant never forgets. Elephants are among very few animal species which recognise death. But we can't say if they really understand it. Mankind is the only species which has developed so many rituals surrounding death. We feel the need to say goodbye to our dead and to find a way to remember them. Funerals help us to do this. Rituals surrounding burial and remembrance take different forms in different cultures. The Piaroa Indians of Venezuela bury their dead in this rock face. They return several times during the year to remember those who have gone before. They'll spend time remembering their ancestors and will stop to rest and eat while they do so. What better to make a snack than some tasty roasted tarantula? Mmm, nice. Could do with some salt. And for those irritating bits of meat that get stuck between the teeth, a fang makes the ideal toothpick. Our last hope for immortality lies in the memories of those who knew us. We leave gravestones that will survive long after living memory has faded, but they too will eventually fade and become unreadable. In the end, we're like all other species. All we really leave behind are our genes. While we might not like the thought of what happens to our bodies, death has plans for our souls too. Whether we believe in the afterlife or not, we're all generally agreed on one thing, that heaven would be infinitely nicer than hell, particularly if we're to be there for eternity. of course, we're told, is a place of eternal fire and torment. Let's be honest, we've actually been a little hard on Death. Death has a function, which he performs very well. Congratulations. Without Death, evolution couldn't happen. 
Over time, weak species have become extinct, and newer, stronger plants and animals have evolved and taken their place. And it's all thanks to death. Death is an absolutely vital part of our world. Without him, humans would never have evolved. It's easy to forget, but the history of our planet is one full of violent geological events. Over millions of years, these events have shaped the planet and all that live on it. Large-scale catastrophes and climate change have been responsible for the extinction of hundreds of thousands of species. The animals that couldn't adapt didn't make it. Fossils are the gravestones of all those species which have gone before. But one species' catastrophe is another's lucky break. That's how evolution works. As one insect, fish or bird dies out, space is created for a new one to evolve. When volcanoes erupt and continents drift apart, whole species of animals can be wiped out. The survivors are those with the most adaptable genes. The Nautilus has existed unchanged for 500 million years. It ruled the oceans before, during and after the dinosaurs walked the planet. The Nautilus is a relative of the octopus, and it lives in deep water during the day. At night, it swims to the surface to feed. The Nautilus is a true survivor. So the next time you swat a fly or watch a funeral go by, remember that death isn't a tragedy, it's a necessity. It's life and death that drive our world. You can't have one without the other. In a funny kind of way, death is directly responsible for the spectacular variety of creatures on Earth. Immortality may sound like an attractive option, but it really wouldn't work. So raise a glass to death, evolution, and our wonderful, wonderful world.